Hi, my name is Shivant Musra and this is my video lab report for Intro Physics 2211 of Georgia Tech. This lab examines the motion of and energy changes involved in an oscillating mass. I'll first introduce, introduce some key ideas, formulas, and diagrams. I'll then analyze the motion of the mass using tracker and construct a computational model to predict its motion. Finally, I'll analyze the results from the model and my observed data and answer some key questions about the lab. So some of the key ideas explored in this lab are listed here. I use Newton's second law and the momentum principle to iteratively predict the motion of the mass as I know the net force acting on the ball at any given point. This net force is comprised of the force due to gravity and the spring force. I also apply the energy principle to this lab to calculate the change in total energy at any point by summing the individual changes in energy. These include the changes in kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and spring potential energy. So the formulas I used are listed here. I use the velocity update and position update formulas to model the change in the ball's motion. To do this, I calculate the net force acting on the ball, which is just the sum of the net force due to gravity and the spring force, whose formulas are shown here. I also calculate the change in each type of energy, kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and spring potential energy. Finally, in this lab, I've taken the system to be the mass, the spring, and the earth. Hence, although the earth does work on the ball, no work is done on the system as a whole. Therefore, W is equal to zero and delta E is equal to zero, and the formula can be expanded to include each individual type of energy, as I've done below. Here are two free body diagrams to illustrate the types of motions we'll be seeing in this lab. The force of gravity always points downwards, as seen through the red arrows in the diagrams. The spring force points parallel to the orientation of the spring and can point in either direction, depending on whether the spring is compressed or stretched. If the spring is compressed, as in the first diagram, the spring force points away from the attachment point. If the spring is stretched, then the spring force points towards the attachment point, as in the second diagram. I used this video provided to us and plotted the x and y positions in tracker for each frame. I chose my axes such that positive x points to the right and positive y points upwards. Here are two excerpts from my code for the computational model. I first set the mass of the ball in its initial position and velocity vectors. I then define g, the acceleration due to gravity close to Earth's surface, the spring constant which I calculated using the period of oscillation in the y direction, and L0, the relaxed length of the spring. Finally, I computed the system energies using the formulas from the previous slide, and set the total energy to be the sum of these individual energies. In the calculation loop, I calculated the force due to gravity and spring force using the formulas from before, and set the net force equal to the sum of these two forces. I then apply the momentum principle using the two formulas shown here to update the ball's position and velocity. I then updated the spring and recalculated L, L hat, and S, the spring displacement from its equilibrium position. And finally, I calculated the change in each form of energy using the same equations from the previous slide. Here's a video of the program in action. The first graph shows the change in energy versus time. The second and third graphs show the y position versus time and x position versus time, respectively. Here's a closer look at that first graph, where we see the change in energy versus time. The gravitational potential energy and the spring potential energy more or less switch back and forth as seen by the fact that they oscillate roughly opposite to each other. However, let's not forget about the kinetic energy, which also oscillates as the mass speeds up and slows down during its motion. What's most interesting in this graph is actually the orange line, which plots the change in total energy. This line is more or less flat and on the x-axis, suggesting no change in the total energy for the entire motion of the mass. We'll come back to this in the last part of the lab. Here's a closer look at the second and third graphs. In both graphs, the predicted and observed motion line up pretty well. However, for the x position versus time graph, we see that the two lines deviate a bit for later time values. This could be down to the fact that I calculated the spring constant using the time period for oscillation using the, y, using the data for the y position, which may not line up perfectly with the x position data, thus resulting in this discrepancy. I'll discuss a potential solution to this in the what does it mean section. For the y position versus time graph, the data lines up pretty well except the maximums and minimums. This could have happened if I overpredicted the initial displacement in the y direction, and therefore all subsequent displacements were greater than the actual displacement. This was likely due to the low frame rate and quality of the video and could be solved with a higher definition and smoother video. So is the energy principle satisfied? Well, from earlier, we said that, the, that, that no work is done on our system, which includes the spring, mass, and the earth. By the energy principle, the work done is equal to the change in total energy of the system. If no work is done, the change in total energy should be equal to zero, which is exactly what we see here with the orange line. Therefore, the energy principle is satisfied. I mentioned earlier a discrepancy in the observed versus prediction, predicted data for x position. This could be solved by calculating the time period for oscillation in the x direction and using that value to calculate the spring constant and use it in the computational model. 
I've calculated the two oscillation time periods, and as is evident, they differ rather significantly. This has quite a major effect on the results, as we use the time period to calculate the spring constant, which is used alongside other variables to predict the mass's motion. What we could do is find an average period of oscillation and use that value in the computational model. Or we could use different time periods of oscillation in the x and y direction, and hence have different spring constants for motion in different directions. However, this would require more advanced math and physics concepts, and a better understanding of the spring force, and is probably beyond the scope of this class. Thank you for your, for your time and have a nice day.